Welcome to Delta Waterfowl's The Voice of the Duck Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Joel Bryce, Vice President of Waterfowl and Hunter Recruitment Programs. Today is podcast episode number seven. And if you saw number six, this is a, a follow up to that podcast. Number six was we discussed the predicted fall flight forecast of ducks for this upcoming hunting season. On this podcast, we're going to do something new and we're going to actually talk about the predicted fall flight forecast of geese. And so if you're a goose hunter, um, you know, tune in. We're going to we're going to talk about what you should expect for this upcoming season. Joining me on this podcast is a is a second time guest here, uh, Dr. Chris Nikolai. Chris is Delta Waterfowl's waterfowl scientist and so he heads up our our research program. Um, just uh, in the short amount of time that we've worked together, Chris, you're you got a lot going on up there, and we're really lucky to, to have you. And looking forward to you sharing. You know, you're a goose guy and a, and a diver, diving duck guy. So looking forward to you sharing all this great information you have. Yeah, no, this is fun. I'm I'm glad we get to talk about geese. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's one thing at Delta. You know, you've, you've been around long enough, right? So one thing that doesn't get talked about very much at the office is geese. Just a lot of a lot of mallard hunters or diver hunters, so you fit in real nice there. Yep. So appreciate you opening up your your home. Um, you know, we're south of Bismarck, North Dakota again. And again, I guess we can't get away from the Missouri River. We have uh, this beautiful setting in the background here, Chris. That must be fun to wake up to every day, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially when the walleyes are running. We can see if it's going to be a... A zoo out there or not or spring migration it's pretty nice you know we had geese right over the house you can see them right here going up the river valley you get your binoculars out you can see them on the other ridge get the spotting scope out and you can see even more over that way so yeah. it's it was pretty cool this spring we'll see how this fall goes you know it's a pretty cool spectacle i think you know the the prairies you know are where the ducks and geese are you know during the hunting season and then when the prairies freeze up real tight it's just impressive the number of yeah. geese primarily that hit this river, but you know there's certainly some ducks too. But pretty cool. Yeah, no, me and the kids um, came and looked at the house when we got done with our hunting trip in Saskatchewan and ran down here. The guy that was selling the house let us empty our huge pile of goose decoys in the empty garage, and there were white fronts and snows just pouring out that morning. Mm -hmm. You know, we were just hunting them the week before in Saskatchewan, and here they were flying over our new house there you go well mid-august um you know uh, go early goose seasons are upon lots of people and, and they are it is here already but uh so we're getting the itch so again we're going to talk about arctic arctic nesting geese and i think that's a really important place to start and so you know i'm from um west central wisconsin i lived a few years in minnesota and here in north dakota we have early canada goose seasons at mid-august and you know, 90 degrees out hunting Canada geese. Those aren't the geese that we're talking about, right, Chris? Right. And they do They do use, and we can go into a little more detail, but it overlaps so much. I mean, they look a lot alike. Then you get a lot of them that aren't breeding for some reason. You know, the ones that hatched here. So they take two to four years to start breeding. So they've got all these teenage years or... Uh, adults tried to nest but the river came up and they couldn't nest so all these ones that don't breed they actually go way up to the arctic as well mm -hmm. for the summer so when people are up there doing banding drives you know you have little hutchies and then huge giants all in the same banding drive and okay you know so they do overlap a lot right but i think for for this discussion we're looking you know we're in the northern part of the united states we're looking way north yep to you know, to frame up this discussion. So basically what we're going to say is, you know, Chris, you're, I mean, you're a goose expert, but Arctic nesting geese, that's the, the lion's share of the continental goose population, right? When you're talking about Arctic nesting geese? Yeah, I guess so. I actually counted out some, uh, added them all together, all the different goose populations and all white cheek geese. You know, you bring all the populations that we'll talk about later, about 8.5 million is what breeds okay. and then white geese uh right now it's probably around 16 million okay and then you can throw in depending on how you count white fronts maybe four million okay and then another four hundred thousand brant and one hundred and thirty thousand emperors okay and you've got all the geese in north america counted there so okay 
you know, there's there's a lot of the Canada goose looking birds out there, but not as many as the white geese. Okay. So so and probably break them half and half. Okay. So if we're talking, you know, the, the Canadian prairies south, those those are those are surveyed and counted and managed completely different than for me the mysterious, the magical geese of the north, right? Yep. Okay, so yep. we're not gonna talk about you know, if there's a goose that nested in southern Saskatchewan or a goose that nested in Oregon, we're not talking about that one, right? Yep. Yeah, and then, you know, you get into those temperate southern breeding geese. For the most part, they're over, well, not officially overabundant, but we got more of them than we need. We're not not as concerned about them because there are tons of them. You know, we've had all these programs to remove them from urban areas, stuff like that, where... The Arctic geese that we're going to talk about are less productive, so they got more boom-bust cycles. Okay. So management concerns are heightened for for these Arctic breeding birds. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So we, again, the, at the very end of this, we're going to share with everybody our prediction for what the upcoming flight of geese will be. Mm-hmm. We're talking about migratory populations of geese. Okay. So I think one thing that, you know, so, you know, we're both wildlife biologists by trade. And it's always amazed me, you know, we're talking about many, many different populations and subspecies of geese, and it changes. It seems like the way they're categorized changes over time, or it has for sure. Maybe we're stuck in one spot, but how many different populations, subspecies of geese are we talking about? And then list some of the bigger groupings that you know people could relate to. Yeah. No, that's a really uh, hot topic in um one of our old friends, old Delta student as well, Jim Leeflor uh, with uh, Canadian Wildlife Service has really taken the charge on this in the last 15 years. There's a old biologist, uh, Harold Hansen, that uh, was really into having lots of groups of geese. I mean, mm-hmm. for white cheek geese, you know, the Canada goose types, um, he was thinking, you know, there's well over 100 different subspecies, <laughs> you know, and that that turns into a problem you know it's like okay we got in north dakota for example you could have missouri river geese are different than james river geese versus shan river geese and Mm -hmm. oh my gosh you just start splitting them you know and um yeah so currently so we can go canada geese have seven subspecies Hmm. and then we got cackling geese which have four subspecies those are split about 16 years ago now and they look the same genetically. They're night and day different. They're further apart than black really? ducks and mallards are. Wow. And um, then you get into the white geese. You know, we have uh, Ross geese, and then we got snow geese. And the snow geese are further split into greaters and lessers. And then, uh, sorry, I forgot to think about the water. Huh? Hey, we all love labs. This is good. Yep. And... Uh, yeah, then you get into white-fronted geese, and you've got the typical North American white-fronted geese, subspecies frontalis, and then you've got this goofy white-fronted goose, a big brown one that winters in California, the Thule goose, that's among the rarest geese in North America. Then you got two brant subspecies, and then you got an emperor goose. So when that all comes together, I tried adding all that up, that's about... 20 well for species that's seven species that make up i think i counted up in my head 18 subspecies hmm. that are managed with 26 management plants Jeez. so so a goose hunter doesn't think at that level obviously right well i this will be the fun part of the conversation because when you get into the willamette valley goose guys in the pacific northwest those guys know their geese better than anybody has because They've got a dusky Canada goose, which is very low population status, less than 15,000 of them. And it's gotten to the point now you can't shoot that one type of Canada goose out of seven subspecies that are wintering there. Hmm. So you have to take a 50-question test. They used to have check stations. And, it, yeah, there's some people that do get into it, you know, where they got Munsell color charts and a pair of calipers to legally tell what they have. So that's that's... I mean, I think that's really cool. I, th- that person's probably the exception, not the norm. Yep. So if you're going out there and saying, I'm going to go shoot some ducks, I'm going to go shoot some geese, 
typical, um, and it's really hard to say typical, but typical duck hunter shooting a, you know, what they would think is a Canada goose, mm -hmm. right? In your bag, you know, all the Canada goose looking subspecies, you know, for big parts of the United States and Canada falls into the same bag. So yep. they're looking at, I shot some Canada geese. I harvested some snow geese. I maybe harvested a Ross's goose. I harvested a white front. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? Brant? Yeah, and you get the brant and the emperors after that. And, you know, not a lot of people see those. Those are our, our sea geese. Okay. You know, live on the okay. oceans. So those are the big, I guess we just kind of did a real short list there, the big lumpings. Yep. But it's interesting to know that there are so many populations or subspecies. And, and I think this is maybe a good segue. So yesterday, or on the last podcast, we talked about ducks. We talked about, you know, the traditional survey area. We've talked about... Um, we, earlier podcast we talked about about how ducks breed and the importance of the prey pothole region, but geese are way different. No, than ducks. geese are way different. They're way so different. much fun. Hit that hit that quick, you know, compare contrast of what yeah. makes what are why biologically I, breeding uh, what what makes them different? Yeah. So with geese, couple things. Um, they don't start breeding till they're two or four, and they form long term pair bonds that typically last until one of the members of the pair dies, you know, so they nearly last forever. But with that, long pair bonds also comes nest site fidelity, which we don't get with ducks. So with waterfowl are really cool as well. For all birds, waterfowl are one of the few birds that go back to where the female's from. Okay. Most other birds go to where the male's from. So this is what makes geese so much different than ducks is that they migrate the same paths year after year. And so they start breeding in segregation and all of a sudden genetically they start diverging. Okay. Ducks, like pintails, for example, you can run genetics on pintails around the Northern hemisphere. You've got one kind of pintail. Okay. You know, so ducks, their pair bonds aren't like that. So they just disperse all over, maintain genetic panmixia and, uh, they don't diverge like geese, where all of a sudden you've got this little group of geese that just do this. They're gen And genetically, they're different. So they're covered under a lot of federal laws, like Endangered Species Act, for example, because it will protect a subspecies. Okay. So so ducks, they'll breed their first year. There is some homing back to their, to, to for their the natal females. area for the females. Yep. But it's not that's not tried and true. We're talking about... 50% is, if 50% of the females came back to where they fledged, that's a lot, right? Mm -hmm. But geese, it's not 100%. Female geese, you now there's, you get a few, the, the time when geese do disperse is the first time they breed. Okay. So when they're a gosling, 80% of them go to where they were hatched, but those other 20% allow some mixing. Okay. And then once they start breeding as an adult, they'll typically go back and we'll almost talk the same nest as big as this table year after year. Hmm. Yeah. That's that that's amazing. Now you start talking about how the heck did they find their way back? But that's a whole nother subject. Oh, yeah. So again, I guess we're building this foundation of of predicting a fall flight of, of Arctic nesting geese. So geese are different. Now and and when we're talking about Arctic nesting geese, they come from a place where Sure, there are people that live there, but it's, they're, talk to that one. These are really remote locations, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and this has been kind of fun, um, you know, as we were talking before, we're going to try to predict the fall flight this year in 2020, the year of COVID. And if I may, mm -hmm. some suggestions from uh, the biologists I was talking to, um, let's try not to speculate. So this gets right into your discussion is who can we contact when the biologist can't go up there you know so it's and it's interesting and i've known this but it really put it in perspective yesterday you know you go to alaska and alaska is really densely populated compared to arctic canada mm -hmm. so you go to the yukon delta for example the most important goose breeding area in the pacific flyway and i've got old technicians that worked for me 20 years ago local native guys on facebook you know so i mm -hmm. can ask them and they're in a village. Oh, yeah, the white fronts were flying over yesterday. They got as many kids as they used to have. Or you talk to some friends that are oil workers at Prudhoe. And they're like, oh, yeah, there's 
you know, Gosling's running all over the place, you know, because these guys actually have oil fields and everything right in, you know, the North Slope breeding areas. You know, it's crazy. Then you talk to the Canadians, and it's like, well, yeah, you know, no one's been up there. You know, there's one banding crew went out of Churchill this year. Otherwise, nobody's been out on the goose colonies in North America this year. Okay. So, great. This is a good, good turning point of our point in our conversation. So, in our last podcast with ducks, we talked about how ducks are surveyed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have the air ground survey that occurs from... You know, the traditional survey area from Minnesota all the way up to Alaska, across Canada, that did not happen this year. So right. a really important piece of information is, you know, a, a, an estimated annual population of breeding ducks and an index of wetland conditions. So those are really two important ingredients. And then we have harvest data. But because of COVID, the spring population and habitat condi- or wetland condition surveys did not happen. But... Yep. We did talk about, okay, so those are important pieces of information um, for lots of reasons. One of them is those are the ingredients of, of how you could even begin to predict a fall flight, to set harvest regulations. Now, geese aren't, they're, they're not surveyed and regulations are not set through that process whatsoever. All right, they're, they're very different. Very different. So they have an entirely different system. Our you know, U.S. and Canadian governments have an entirely different system for estimating those populations, Arctic nesting goose populations, than ducks. It's remote. There aren't a lot of the, there aren't roads through those areas, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I've always heard these discussions, and you've talked about it. You know, you have Arctic uh, goose or Arctic nesting goose banding camps, and you know, where you're banding geese. How are geese? How are goose numbers estimated? How are they counted? How, do, how are seasons set with, with geese? Yeah, so they, they vary. And I'd say there's three ways, thinking about it here, there's three general ways that we deal with managing goose populations or obtaining the management number. Mm-hmm. Okay. So one would be breeding ground surveys, similar to a duck survey. And for the most part, people gave up on that stuff in the early 2000s maybe even the 90s because it's hard you either get dense colonial nesting birds like snow geese and brant Mm -hmm. or you get these crazy dispersed birds that are on the tundra they might be in the boreal they're impossible to detect you know a lot of the canada geese and the white fronts especially you get into those boreal forest white fronts you just can't see them Mm -hmm. then um you get winter counts which we still do, brant are managed off winter counts. Oh, okay. Because um, similar to swans, they're relatively easy to count. There's not a gabillion of them. You know, each brant population hovers around 150,000, and they don't sit in very many places. So mm-hmm. they're not too hard to count. Um, and then what we've been getting into a lot lately is using banding data to estimate how many geese there are. So. Okay. It's called Lincoln Estimator, another Delta graduate from years ago, Ray Alisoskis, brought this old technique back front and center. And we've been switching to a lot of goose populations being managed with a Lincoln Estimator. Okay. Which we could get into more if you want to later. But, but if you, so you go up, have, there's established camps in most of these locations, right? So most of them. buildings and facilities, fuel or supplies are flown in or boated in helicopter so you you go out and you round up geese and and ban those geese then what well when you're trying to do the management plan kind of stuff yeah it's so it's pretty cool so i'll try to do a quick analogy but in science class hopefully in high school a bunch of us get a chance to estimate how many beans are in a jar Mm -hmm. and so what you do is you got some size of jar with some number of beans that the teacher knows and uh, what you do is you pull a handful of beans out and put like a Sharpie marker on each one of them. Mm-hmm. You just banded a bunch of beans. Okay. Okay. Put them back in. Migration hasn't happened yet. Let's shake this jar up. Let them migrate down to wintering areas or migration areas even. And you pull out a second handful. The second handful is a harvest survey. Okay. Okay. So this is what hunters shot. And we get the denominator is... 
what we get from like the wing bee, you know, how many geese people shot. Then there's a numerator we can put on top of that ratio that's how many of those bands from that first sample were included in the second sample. Okay. And you can use that ratio to expand that first number and get an estimate of population size. Okay. So you okay. mark a subset, subset and each one of those banded birds represents a larger number of birds in the entire population. Yep. Right? So with a lot of these, the magic number is about 100 bands per year in that second fistful of beans. Okay. And depending on harvest pressure influences how many you need to bark in that first sample. Okay. Like snow geese, for example, you know, only 3% of them get shot annually. So you got to band a lot of them to make this work. Where you get into something like some of the Canada goose populations, you know, 10% of them get harvested. So you don't have to band as many on that front end, which is lucky because they're harder right. to catch. Right. So with ducks, so that there's the spring surveys that are conducted. And up until very recently, what we, what biologists estimated for duck populations and water conditions, that was used to set that fall's duck season. Yep. Now it sets the fall after's duck season. Yep. So you band these geese, you're getting estimates of harvest rates by, you know, the number of bands that hunters call in and report, right? So is the, is the, at what point does, do, do harvest rates of bands set a season? Yeah, well, the, it's not necessarily the harvest rate. It's more of estimating that population okay. size. Um, they're intertwined sure, for sure. Yeah. But with most goose management plans, it's when there's 100,000, we do this. When it exceeds 130,000, we go to the next level. Okay. Above this. there's, And then there's some examples where maybe there's a complete reproductive bus that year mm -hmm. where you can knock that down, you know, be conservative. So they are a little different. And keep in mind with ducks, too, for the most part, we're using mallard data mm -hmm. to set 20-something species worth of regulations. Okay. With geese, we don't have a blanket approach like that. You know, with ducks, there's exceptions. You know, we've got canvas backs, we got mm -hmm. pintail models, right. scop, black ducks, eastern wood ducks, stuff like that. But with geese, this is where we go back, you know, where we've got 30, nearly 30 management plans for geese. You know? Right. It's crazy. So the banding occurs during spring and summer. I'd say summer. late summer. Late yep. summer. Hunting season occurs in the fall. So the change won't come really for a harvest perspective until the next year under right. that scenario. Yep. Now, you just mentioned, and this is the one thing, we get a lot of phone calls. Hey, how did the breeding, how was breeding this year? Hey, I heard there was a lot of snow. I heard there was an early frost. I heard, yep. I heard, I heard. Um, and that's, so geese are banded during, in those camps. But then also in that year, you, you, you know what the, what the output was. Yeah, and right? usually in those camps, people are there before banding. So, like, Carrick Lake still has projects going on, you know, monitoring snow geese and Ross geese. And you have the La Perouse Bay group still doing, you know, a lot of historical, mm -hmm. uh, maintaining a historical data set for production. YK Delta has a whole suite of surveys because there's so many species there. And we've got a couple threatened duck species there as well that need to be surveyed. So they lump them all into one effort. And there's a bunch of those production mm -hmm. surveys here and there. And like Atlantic population of Canada geese have been a hot topic lately for Atlantic mm -hmm. flyway hunters and getting very restrictive due to a series of bad reproduction years. This year, sound, you know, people put enough effort that you have an important population like that. You got to get someone out there to at least assess it. And, you know, like this year, they're predicting, you know, that that's going to be a reproductive bus this year. Okay. So the banding is more longer term trends, yep. right? But so this isn't how it works, probably. But, you know, you're, let's say you're in a goose colony and the entire reproductive effort failed because of weather or some catastrophic event. Can that information trigger a change that upcoming hunting season? Can it happen that fast? I th think so in a couple situations. For the most part, no. Okay. For the most part, we let that go and count that as, you know, natural cycles. But 
you know, um, the Atlantic population of geese are front and center. They're probably the most watched group of geese right now just because we've had some bad cycles in the last few decades and closures, very tight restrictions, etc. And then an old group of geese that we used to monitor, um, EPP geese, they've been lumped into some other geese now. But historically, you know, they were very well-watched group of geese that six provinces and states really okay. hammered. And they actually had some thresholds like that, you know, from their camp, their nesting camp okay. could influence that year's regulations. But for the most part, that's pretty rare. Okay. So if a goose hunter calls Chris and says, hey, Chris, uh, I live here. Tell me what I should expect from for a goose migration. Mm -hmm. So that, in a typical year, that would be fueled by two pieces of information. Hey, the the population size is estimated at this, it's trending up or down, or it's been a very stable population. And my friends in that, you know, that were banding in that source population mm -hmm. say it was a good year. Yeah. Right. And that's what you would, that's the information you would share with that's someone. That's pretty right? much what we got for the fall. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Regulations are already set. Okay. And it's like, oh, are you going to be hunting hard adult geese or are you going to be hunting a goose population with a bunch of juveniles, which usually has higher success rates. So that right there is, okay, so COVID-19, nobody's in the Arctic camps, save for one that you said. So how many camps are people typically in? Like how many, hmm. is there someone banding in every source population of Arctic nesting geese? Yeah, I and mean, for the most part, there is. Um and I'd say it, it used to be even busier. Like right. when I was doing graduate work on the YK Delta, for example, we had four camps studying Brandt, a camp studying Cacklers, another camp studying Emperors, another study in White Fronts. I mean, we were all within 10 miles of each other. Hmm. And right now, I bet you the only one that's left is the one studying Brandt. Right. You know, but yeah, but we can go... Through, I mean, for the most part, there are these monitoring programs because it's required in each of these 30-ish management Got plans. It. Got it. Yeah, we'll get into the specific forecast, but that I guess that's the, you know, similar to ducks, we're lacking a lot of key information this to, year. Get, to give a great outlook yep. for fall flights of geese. So now the banding, so, so people weren't banding this year. Does that interrupt the population trend data? Oh, yeah. There's going to be, it's going to be really interesting going to conferences and anything in life. I think we're going to have a lot of missing data for 2020. Okay. Hopefully it's just one year. You know, there's a lot of concerns with anything, you know, how long this is going to go. But, you know, and that, that's another part we were talking about before is people mixed with geese. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen all these travel restrictions just in the lower 48 or in southern Canada, just from province to province, there's actually been barricades put up from going into these remote villages because they are quite isolated. Right. And it's like, okay, how far could that carry on in the future where it just changes the way we travel? We don't know. Right. So, yeah, so COVID-19 has affected everyone, and the waterfowl world is no exception. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, that that's really cool. So, it, we're, we're, I think, so we've, we've talked about, you know, geographically where these geese occur that we're talking about and holy cow is there a ton of different geese um thousands and thousands and it's it's just absolutely amazing we've talked about how populations are estimated how seasons are set now before we get into you know a you know chris nikolai's prediction of or discussion of maybe expectation setting i think it's really important to talk about your credentials yeah. right and so how long have you been professionally employed as a as a waterfowl scientist well i started what about eight months ago with delta and then 10 years before that with fish and wildlife service where i worked for migratory birds pretty much helping to coordinate the efforts in california and nevada and then before that, I went to grad school for way longer than most people. <laughs> I was having too much fun. And yeah, I think I had my first paid duck job back in 1993. Okay. How many years? So you've spent a 
ton of time in the Arctic in some of these goose camps. How many years? How many different yeah. years? How many different years? I'd say from 97 till last year. And there's maybe two summers when my kids were born that, that I didn't go okay. to the Arctic. So what is that? That's 20, 21 years. Wow. I guess. Sometimes so, multiple trips in the same year. So you're, how you get to that location ultimately is probably different based on each camp. Every camp, yep. Some boat, some helicopter, some... How do some you get you into can these? plane. Some. There's one camp uh, that I went to with Canadian Wildlife Service guys up in Coral Harbor, Nunavut, uh, up on Southampton Island. We stayed in the house in oh. Coral Harbor. Drove a truck each day to the helicopter at the airport. That was pretty cool. But and then flew out. Then flew out. But while we drove that 15-mile road out to the airport, we drove past 1,200 snow geese and huh. a couple brant. It was pretty fun. <laughs> so, okay, so you, you kind of set one end of the spectrum there. You're in a house, modern facility. Oh, we were watching satellite TV every <laughs> night. Yeah, taking hot showers. Yeah, whereas others... Um, yeah, what's the other side of that spectrum? Yeah, I'd say last summer was probably the most, I wouldn't say extreme, but uh, the most laid-back camp I'd ever been to, where this was up east of Barrow on the Ikpikpuk River Delta. Group of snow geese, there's a bunch of brant there, and some other molting geese. And uh, yeah, that one was fun. We went in uh, with a small helicopter and a small plane and, you know, dropped off a backpack each for a week worth of work, maybe a backpack full of nets, a uh, bare fence. And, you know, we probably had our six sleeping tents in a 12 by 14 foot area. Mm -hmm. And we had another tent hundred feet that way that we could all hunt, hug, huddle under. There we go. Just to cook our food. So we had all our smells and everything right. away from, from tents, you know, and that was it. Two drums of fuel in our 44, a pilot, six guys, and 2,000 goose bands. <laughs> how long would it take? How long did it take you to put on those 2,000 bands? Took us about three days, and then the weather came in, and we sat there for about four days before we could get out. Yeah. And never did finish. No, nope, we did, finished. You did finish. Yep. Yep, we finished. I think we had 40 more bands left over that yeah. we were really hoping to get out, and we went to bed and woke up to just a hellacious storm. So, so, okay, so that took you three days to, to catch. So we're talking about, I mean, these are very dense congregations of birds. Are you driving them into a, into a trap system? Yep, into uh, nets that we set up quite quickly. Okay. Yeah. And just for the listener, what allows you to, so these are flightless birds. So, so talk to the listener about what is it that those geese are experiencing that allows yeah. you to drive them in there. Yeah, so this is another one of those neat factoids that geese are different than ducks. Geese, molt, the adults, will drop their flight feathers two weeks after hatch, week and a half after hatch, and then they're growing new wings while the goslings are growing their first wings. So they're all flightless. The whole family's the flightless. They're hanging out. Ducks, never happens. Ducks, mom raises them. She can fly the whole time. And finally, one day, mom separates herself from the ducklings, and either she can molt locally right now, or she might even wait till November to go down to Louisiana and molt on the wintering grounds. So ducks and geese are very different, and oh, it makes geese so vulnerable to, okay. to banding. So some of these camps that band high, high volumes, how long is that camp open then? Strictly for banding. Strictly for banding 10 days. Okay. And that's a long one. I mean, YK Delta... We'd usually get our quotas. It, it's very dense. YK Delta is very different than these other places I've been. I mean, they all have a lot of geese, but where they're all at on the YK Delta is this itty bitty patch. So you can catch a lot of geese really quick and okay. close. So you don't have to be out there as long. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, I, that, that's really cool. I think we could probably spend a whole podcast talking about some of those cool camps and cool experiences uh, that you've had. We'll kick that one, we'll kick that can down the road. But I think, so let's talk about, are you comfortable? I, I think we need to set some sideboards here. So, you know, you said a, a biologist told you, yeah, don't speculate. Mm -hmm. Well. That, some informed speculation. How does that sound? It, it, we're going to have to do informed speculation. Yep. Chris, we get, you know, as the Duck Hunters Organization, maybe we should have a, a sub-slogan there called the Goose Hunters Organization. But 
it, you know, we get phone calls and say, hey, you know, and you can't just say, well, I don't know. Mm-hmm. We have information. Yep. We can put some caveats on there that we're missing very key ingredients. But the nice thing about a guy like you who's been in the field for quite a while, been in so many camps, you have a network of friends and mm-hmm. contacts who, like you just said, the, the, the gentleman in the remote village who has Facebook, which sounds funny to me, but to the biologist, people aren't out there, but people are paying attention. Mm-hmm. So any other sideboards you want to put on this before we start going flyway by flyway? No, no. I think the only other one, which will feed a lot of our informed speculation, is just technology this, these days, you know, where we can get snow cover maps and right. remote weather stations, and that's about all we got, luckily. So we can speculate based off of, inform speculation based off of remote weather stations. data, yep. remote weather stations. The other one, Chris, you love telemetry. Mm-hmm. You love transmitters and you love the data that you can, and the information you can glean from putting a transmitter on a, on a duck or a goose or anything else. So that you ha- you have some information on that too, right? We're getting a little bit right now. You know, there's a lot of goose projects right now with the coolest radio telemetry. I wouldn't even call it telemetry. The coolest radios we've ever had. So we've got a big effort in the Pacific Flyway that I've been involved with for years, and a bunch of our colleagues based out of Texas and Albuquerque and places have been marking a bunch more geese. You know, white fronts in particular, Louisiana. Um, you know, down in the, the bottom of the central and Mississippi flyway. And, you know, these radios are so cool. They got solar panels on the outside. They can recharge every day to the point where they're collecting as many as five points an hour. Okay. You know, so we can get these really neat maps. It's not just a dot once a week like we did 15 years ago. This is where we can see a goose. Well, for example, in the last two weeks... Um, some of them are, are, we're getting data from them again. Mm-hmm. So when you go to the Arctic, well, when you're anywhere, these radios talk to cell phone towers. Okay. So they store GPS data and they're pre-programmed once a day when they're near a cell phone tower to dump that data. Okay. So they pretty much have a clean slate every day. But as you get above that boreal prairie line, cell phone towers tend to disappear. Mm-hmm. Now it is amazing. I mean, and we'll get into this, I guess. But all of a sudden, they go quiet come late May. And we're like, ah, oh, you know, we've been enjoying watching, like, this spring, them going north and coming back. Mm-hmm. You know, some of these radios went north on 994, like, five times this spring, chasing these storms. And so it's fun. And then all of a sudden, it just goes quiet. And we're kind of, oh, yeah. it's quiet all summer. The fun time's just been starting the last two weeks. Just coming back into cell they're, range. They're moving now. You know, they went to the hinterlands, and maybe we'd get a ping in Nanuvik or Prudhoe Bay or something in the spring migration, mm-hmm. but that's less than 5% of them will hit one. But we're, now we're starting to get those birds moving. They got their wings back. Their goslings are flying. They're starting to look for berries, and we're starting to get a couple to, to ping right now, and it's really neat. You can So they're storing all that data. We're just not hearing from them. Mm-hmm. And if they survive all summer... When they hit a tower, they can typically dump all that data in minutes. And we get, it's like a Christmas present every morning. <laughs> and at this time of year, I can't wait to turn on my computer to just see who pinged yeah. on this morning. And, uh, yeah, it's really neat. You know, so, like, this week we had a snow goose actually, its radio hit in northern Saskatchewan. But it probably hit, like, an old 2G tower or wasn't close to it long enough. And we could tell it moved but we didn't get all its downloads. But okay. we'll probably get that when it hits a better tower soon. But all of a sudden, we know there's one that's already made a big jump. And then we've gotten a couple, all, like I was saying, at, at Crudo, because the oil fields have all their communications based sure. off cell phone towers. And then one pinged about four miles from Barrow. So mm. they are just hitting the local Barrow cell phone tower. That's cool. That's cool. And well, you look at them, and it's neat. Okay, so then you can look at them. And you'll have a goose that just goes to a spot. You just see a billion dots, like as big as this table, as mm-hmm. we mentioned before. That's an obvious bird that's nesting. Sure. Then 
Geese are pretty cool. We were talking earlier too. If they're not breed, if they're relieved of breeding for some reason, they're too young to breed. Mm -hmm. Their nest got destroyed. Usually, if their goslings got killed, that's too late. But if it's before that, they'll go move somewhere far away, and you can tell a non-breeding movement pattern mm -hmm. versus the breeding ones. And yeah, from the three that I think I've seen, maybe two from the North Slope, they look like they bred. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so then, it's not much. Right. But then you get, yeah. So obviously a weather event didn't destroy that nesting location. Right. For those those points to stack on top of each other. So yeah, you just, can get some information. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And the unfortunate part, like that group, we have a hundred of these out, but it's not real time. So we got to wait for these things to hit the towers to maybe we'll have a more informed okay. set of data later. But by then, we might have our friends in Yellowknife say, oh my gosh, they started pouring over and half the flocks are gray. Okay. You know? Meaning juveniles. Juveniles. Right. Okay. All right. So let's jump into it. Uh, this is this is the fun part. Well, it's all been fun, Chris. That's, that's a, it's a really fun discussion. So if we go to the Atlantic Flyway, let's go to the West Coast. What types of geese are we talking about now? Okay. So yeah, For hunters. West, hunter expectation. Yep. So West Coast, um, you know, excluding all these temperate breeding birds, you know, you've got these goofy populations going up the Alaska Panhandle. You know, you got these Vancouver Canada geese that turn into duskies that turn into, uh, they kind of just morph into smaller body sizes to parvipes and tabs, which is the first cackler. We, I haven't heard much information from that. Um, it probably wouldn't be that hard. I could have reached out for dusky Canada geese, for example, or mostly monitored by the Forest Service out of Cordova, but I haven't heard anything from them. Um, then you get the YK Delta. So I reached out to the waterfowl biologist, Brian Daniels, there, and some old uh, technicians, native guys that worked for me 20 years ago, and they're saying it looks great. Okay. You know, there's plenty of goslings flying around. So the YK Delta historically used to predict produce 80% of the black brand, 95% of the emperors, 100, well, 90% of the Pacific Flyway white fronts, 100% okay. of the cackling Canada geese, the minimas, and you get a few tabs there, and yeah, so the big chunk, white front hunting in the Pacific Flyway sounds like it's going to be pretty good. Okay. He was out, it was actually pretty cool, he went out in March like we used to do, drop a bunch of camp off or camp equipment with airplanes and snow machines mm -hmm. planning to go to camp and all of a sudden everything shut down and it sat on the tundra till three weeks ago mm -hmm. and he went out there to go pick it up and spent some time and he said things look normal okay so uh, just a shouldn't be at this point no indications of a catastrophic no nope. breeding event. i think pacific flyway guys are gonna have the year man because the next place we'll go to now, I just got this information last night, is there's a population of snow geese in Russia, at Wrangell Island. And uh, we got a good friend there, Vasily Baranyuk, that uh, that guy goes up. He spends like four months alone living in a you know 10-foot box hmm. with bears looking in every night. Hmm. He sometimes gets helpers, but... Wrangell Island's always been one of these snow goose colonies that was down, depressed low. Fifteen years ago, it started ticking up. Last year, it screamed up. It went from like 260,000 geese to 400,000. Wow. This year, they're thinking it goes above a million. So no one has ever seen Wrangell Island snow geese explode like this before. So this will be fun. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, Vasily did another good job up there. Then as you move east, you get into the North Slope, and, and I haven't heard much from folks. You know, there's usually some camps from the North Slope Borough, the Alaska Science Center, USGS guys at the Ikpik Puck and around Teshik Puck Lake and Colville River Deltas, and no one got to go up, you know, to okay. the actual colonies this year. But weather patterns on the North Slope, similar to Wrangell, seem to be above warm, you know, above normal for warmth and everything. Okay. So things sound pretty good there for weather patterns. Okay. And you could probably extend that into the next big goose colony would be Banks Island. No one's there. You got Saks Harbor down in the southwest corner of Banks Island in the Canadian Arctic. 
but usually that's a colony good for about a million geese. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone based off weather data, the further west you go in the Arctic, in the North American Arctic, things are probably better. Okay. So again, banks is going to be important, but banks is where things start getting different. About half the birds go to the Pacific Flyway, and the other half come down the Great Plains. So we're, we're you're now taking us east. Yep. So we're moving now east. Now we're in the colonies. Now we're in the Central Flyway a little bit. We're getting there. Okay. Yep. So, you know, the western mid continent, you know, Great Plains areas might see some of this good production from banks, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And then you go east and you start getting into Queen Maud Gulf. And that's one of the big, there's three areas. The next three that we'll do is where the bulk of the mid continent snow geese mm -hmm. and ross geese come from. So you got Queen Maud Gulf where Ray Alisoskis and Keel Drake and Dana Kellett have all been working for decades and, and other people. But those are the ones I talked with and they don't know. You know, um, weather there. It'll take a moment here as well. So back in 17, the Arctic exploded. It was probably the biggest production of geese in the history. You know, when you combine it with agriculture and everything. 18 was among the biggest catastrophic failure ever recorded. 19 last year was so-so. What was that failure in 18 due to? Snow during hatch. Okay. So it just killed all the eggs and probably mostly goslings that just hatched. And when we're look, when all these um, you know colleagues have been looking at weather data, is talking to Frank Baldwin from uh, from Winnipeg. Uh, the weather patterns for 2020 matched 2018 very well. Okay. Scaringly well, which was the year of a bust. Okay. But no one's there. You know, last year we thought it was going to be a bust. Even banding didn't look that great. And there were some patches of reproduction last year. Like hunting in Saskatchewan for me last year, I've never seen so many juvenile Roskies. Really? Okay. And it was crazy, and it wasn't predicted. So as you move east, you know, you got Queen Maud Gulf, you got Southampton Island, and then you got Baffin. Um, those three areas produce the bulk of the mid-continent white geese and nearly all the Ross geese. Okay. And, uh, yeah, weather. So concerns about weather patterns yep. matching. Matching two years ago failure. Okay. Um, and even Baffin compared to last year. Last year, Baffin was pretty snow-free um, during nest initiation. Mm -hmm. This year it was pretty much covered in, in snow and ice. Okay. So it doesn't look good for that, that So that's area. the lake geese. What, how do you, you know, what's the information used to to talk about a you know migratory dark geese yeah no no that's good you brought that up because we just passed over all the white fronts and cackling you know little hutchy geese um you know and hutchies are probably the second most abundant geese behind our temperate breeding giants mm -hmm. um you know it's usually close to half a million breeding geese so they're all in the same areas now they're inland a little bit more okay so that might help them because uh, the coast stays frozen longer. So things could be different, but they're in the same areas based on this weather pattern that okay. that folks are looking at. It doesn't look that great. Did it did it affect the dark east in eighteen the same way? Yeah. Okay. Except uh, snow or sorry, white fronts tend to smear a little bit further west than snow. Okay. So. A lot of these mid-continent white-fronted geese are actually coming from the slope in okay. western Canada. So, as we've mentioned, the weather patterns to the west part of the Arctic has been warmer. So, okay. hopefully those Alaska white fronts, north slope breeding white fronts, are doing pretty good. Okay. So, for this fall's flight, optimism for a white front population? In the mid-continent, probably a solid average. Solid average, to too. Okay, but then when we're talking Maybe. about the, the various Canada's cacklers and and snow geese, Ross's geese, you have concern. Yeah, no, I think we have a lot of concerns that the weather was almost the same as 2018. Okay, okay, well, hey, it is what it is, and it's just, you know, I think I think as as biologists, waterfowl managers, I think one of the most important roles that we can play is to set expectation. Yeah, not promise. Yep. Not hide, but just set expectation. And so I think you're doing a great job. Yeah, I, I, yeah. It's definitely not one of those years that it, it's not like 17 was. 
I mean, 17, everybody heard that it was going to be gangbusters now. Yeah. You know, and this year, we're it's just lack of information, you know. Like, the, the next best set of da- information we got from colleagues, this came from Rocky Rockwell, and, you know, was, he had some guys in Churchill go out to their long-term data set, and they only banded a, a few hundred geese. A quarter of them, a fifth of them were goslings. Okay. You know, those are snow geese, so... You know, but that's further south. There's not as many breeding white geese there. There's okay. a lot of dark geese. Things look, that's about look normal. Better. Okay. About normal, actually. Okay. So, one question. So, when those catastrophic weather events come through, and it, it can wipe out an entire year's reproductive effort, do the adults do fine during those, those episodes? If anything, I'd say... I'd predict the gods, the adults will be in even better shape next year because now they've been relieved of broodering da- duties. Okay, got you it. Know, it takes a lot of energy to keep your heads up and watch for predators to make sure your goslings can eat, or you know, where you don't have the kids, you can go to where the food's better, get in better shape, and set the stage for a better effort next year. Okay, so I think you know, you know. John Devney likes to say we don't shoot the breeding population, we shoot the fall flight. And when there's a stronger reproductive effort, hunters tend to be a lot more successful Mm -hmm. because the juveniles, as he said, they make more mistakes. So when we're crossing over to geese, that has to be the exact same situation, right? It's similar. Yeah, no, there's... See, this is where studying geese is so much more exciting. You can get the devils in the details with geese compared to ducks. I mean, ducks... To see a brood, we're having to fly drones now mm-hmm. to do it the right way. Geese, nah, you don't have to do that. You can sit in a tower, and we put bands on them all when they were hatching, and we can use a spotting scope. We can tell those four kids belong to those two parents. And, yeah, so you get you get to learn the family group component more. And mm-hmm. geese stay together as a family group more. So there's some neat studies on Arctic geese uh, in Europe, northern Europe, that actually shows... You know, this is how neat the family group studies can be, but some females know that they can't raise their kids that well, so they'll happily give their kids their kids away. <laughs> Where other parents are like, hey, we're really good, we'll take your kids, because that'll swamp the predators out when predators come. And beyond that, they'll actually keep the adopted kids on the periphery of the family. Hmm. You know, and then they keep these pair bonds through the fall. So some people speculate i don't think we have the best data on this but you know those goslings are at the bottom when you got a big swirl of geese in the fall most of that bottom of that tornado are probably juveniles those adults are up the top you know right 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 you know, sacrifice don't do it yeah. guys you know stay up <laughs> stay up you know and you'll see cool movement you know you'll see a bird hop into a family group yeah. getting per- getting scolded from the parents and stuff but but the same thing, the vulnerability to harvest happens in geese as well, just naive juveniles. Yeah, so you're going to see, you know, in a, in a wipeout year of reproduction, you're going to see fewer geese, of course. But you're still going to see geese. They're just going to be older, wiser, yep, less prone to mistakes. Yep. Okay, survival of the fittest, right? And see, that's also how hunters respond to, you know, how not as many people go out because uh, it's a bust. It's going to be really hard this year, so it's almost self-regulating. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, maybe we shouldn't shoot as many this year. Well, we probably aren't because word got out and not as many people are going to go. And then they're all going to be really hard to get geese as yeah. well. Okay, cool. So that's where the regulatory, we don't have to be that fast because it does uh, kind of self-regulate. You know, got just it. word of mouth and hunter behavior. Got it. Cool. So I think you've carried us to central Mississippi flyway. Are we easing into that Mississippi Atlantic? Yeah, no, or? I'd say we're kind of exactly there. So. You know, Baffin's still way up there. We already talked about that. But now you're coming around the south part of Hudson Bay and James Bay. you got a Gamsky Island. Things are looking warmer there, but it sounds like they're wetter. Okay. And talking with, especially Rod Brook from, from Ontario, um, as you move east, things don't sound that good, you know, extending up into Baffin. Okay. And, you know, that gets into a couple of these unique Atlantic flyway goose populations. You know, things don't look good. That Atlantic population's been in trouble for a while. And so it's kind of a bummer that they got a, another bad year under their belt. And about the only one left I didn't hear anything from is greater snow geese. They're 
among the highest latitude breeding birds in the world. Mm. And um, yeah, I sent an email to, to Joe Godier, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to hear from him. He's a good guy, but you know, short notice and no idea what's going to be going on up there, given all the other eastern cold, wet conditions. Hard to tell. Okay. So, and I'd say that's probably about it for for all our geese or all our normal geese. So the informed speculation is you could go to the Western Arctic, Arctic, and as you transition to the to the far east, it's just kind of a downhill decline. In if you're a Pacific Flyway goose hunter this year, get some more decoys. Okay, it's going to be a fun year. I might have to go back and visit. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's cool. Well, do you think we missed anything, Chris? No, I don't think at all. Uh, it's been fun to talk about geese. Um, hopefully, you know, some folks think about what biologists do and how we mm-hmm. do it. And, you know, if anyone ever has questions, you know, reach out. I can, if I can't help, I can point people to the, to the folks to do. Okay. I have to give you a soapbox here for a second here. You, you love Brandt. Right. Oh yeah. That's like I think on this piece of paper I, I won't say it all. It's where is that? Black Brant kick all other waterfowl <laughs> butts. Yep. I'll use butts. So tell tell us about your love of of Black Brant. Oh, uh, they're just a cool goose. Um, yeah, I've got to hunt Atlantics as well and help help some cool guys ban some some Brant over in Iceland. But uh, yeah, just a neat bird and one. You know, as I learned, I did my master's and and PhD on Brant, and they're so easy to study. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, the colonies that I or the colony that I focus most of my work on, my advisors, he's well over 30, 30 years of data before he handed it off to another former student. And uh, you know, we're walking up to nests that seventy percent of the adults are banded. So, and you know, and you come up, and it's like, wow, again. Here, she's at this nest bowl right here. We put a tongue depressor on the north side of the nest. And sometimes you'll hit that to put a new tongue depressor in. There's already 30 of them there. Mm. You know, one from each year for the last 35 years, basically. Yeah? Yeah, in that same bowl. So it builds up until that No, all the stuff every year blows away. Okay. But there's still that scrape in the dirt. And then our tongue depressors, we don't pull them out. They're wood. Built around. Biodegradable. Oh, my goodness. And so it, it, they're so neat to study, you know, and I've gone up, I've gone all the way down to Baja, Mexico, reading the plastic bands we put on. And, you know, we've got one of the personally coolest papers ever done with waterfowl. And we did it with spotting scopes and pieces of plastic mm-hmm. where, where we do it with radios now. But we read bands in all these different wintering areas and then looked up their breeding records that next year. And sure enough, when they start breeding, how many eggs they lay, how successful they are, is totally dependent on what latitude they wintered at. Mm. So they're so easy to study, and we go forever with that. Second, they taste awesome. Yeah. Black Brant do. Atlantic Brant, not so much. Black Brant are right up there with juvenile white fronts and cranes. Mm. Maybe even blue grouse, but I always put blue grouse (laughs) higher up. And then thirdly... They are so fun to hunt. Really? They are the goose that flies like a bluebill. Hmm. And, I mean, they just, you're on the ocean, you're hunting wind. I mean, I've hunted in Puget Sound where there's snow geese as well. And you be, oh, look at that group of snow geese. That's cool. You know, and they're bucking the wind, flying along, and all of a sudden, here comes a group yeah. of brant twice as fast as them, right into the wind, hmm. and just right into your decoys. Oh, they're fun. Yeah. So if you're... Uh, Black Brant hunter on the West Coast, they're not happy with you right now because you just shined all this positive attention on these guys. Uh, Brant, <laughs> Brant, Black Brant have been getting too much attention, I, I think, for the last decade. But um, that's okay. We're, we're managing them. We've got a lot of good cooperators yeah. on that one. We're not terribly concerned. But, yeah, we, we have had some increase in harvest on Black Brant in the last decade from... A lot of articles, several of us have probably contributed. There you go. There you go. Hey, that's what the waterfowl science is for, to, to manage those upticks in, yep. in harvest. So, hey, well, I think that's uh, that wraps it up. Um, Chris, you said before you're open to, to questions. Uh, if anybody has any questions, jump on our website, give Chris a call, send him an email. Um, 
you're going to get all the information you wanted and probably more. So I guess with that, we'll wrap up. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this podcast. Um, again, you know, the previous podcast about the duck fall flight forecast, we just complimented it with, uh, with uh, insight on Arctic nesting goose fall flight predictions. As always, we would love your feedback. If you have any questions, please submit them. We do want to do an entire podcast devoted to listener questions. Mm -hmm. That way we know that that podcast is addressing the interest of our members and listeners. So we appreciate it. Again, if you're watching this through YouTube or, or, or jumping on our website to find that, you know, please consider uh, doing an audio download. Go into Apple, Stitcher, TuneIn, anything like that. So, again, we appreciate it. And until the next podcast, take care.